Well, thank you very much. And it's a great pleasure to be at the Institute for Government because not many places do I discuss with enthusiasm single departmental plans. <laughs> not, not a very exciting subject across my breakfast table, but it's great to be here. Because um, I, this year, pub well, last year, published the first, my first annual report as chair of the PAC. So it's interesting to see where we touch together. Uh, and that's really quite a personal perspective as I sit uh, every week, twice a week, looking in depth at what government departments are doing well and what they're doing badly. Usually, of course, we're looking at the problems that have arisen. Increasingly, though, we're trying to look at what will look at projects early to try and preempt problems. So this um, work you've done is very helpful uh, to me in helping to shape what we do. I should also, of course, uh, mention that although we're, we look at the public spending, it is the um, Constitutional Affairs uh, Committee, the Spurner Jenkins Committee, that really does the work on civil service reform. And he's undertaking a big piece of work now. We work very closely together. Um, I know he's working with the Institute with interviews uh, with civil servants and ministers, which is going to hopefully get a good database of information, which we hope will be useful to us. So we are very much hand in glove on that. Um, we look at the financial aspects of it, the efficiency and effectiveness of taxpayers' money. And it's interesting that you highlight um, single departmental plans because they don't sound very sexy, do they? They don't sound very interesting. But my vision is that these will become easy to read documents that really mean something to the average citizen so that you can just go up, log on to gov.uk or whatever, find this and see what impact that will have for you in your area of interest, your locality, uh, your school or whatever. And at the moment, they are a long, long way away from that. And I, you get the impression, certainly we do sitting in the committee, that they're a bit of a pain in the neck for, for the permanent secretaries. It's just, if you're hurling the Home Office, it's not very sexy to produce a single departmental plan when you're dealing with terrorists <laughs> and policing and all of those things. And so, the, in, in the terms of the priorities, I think it's really interesting the, to, to see that chart of the number of priorities that government have. And I want to talk a little bit about how um, the, the political management works on that, because continuity is a really key issue. In the committee, we're constantly barracking permanent secretaries about the number of changes of senior responsible owners of a project, of CEOs and so on, because we see so much change that it's very difficult then to pin down who was responsible for implementing a decision uh, who, or making the decision in the first place. Um, and politically, it's interesting because David Cameron, of course, as a prime minister, is probably one that in recent times the one who actually allowed ministers to stay in post for a long time. And that had some benefits because, you know, ministers then became more experts sometimes than their civil servants with the high turnover. There can be drawbacks, of course, to a minister getting too embedded and not being challenging enough. But actually, and on balance, that can be a very good thing because you get that continuity and hopefully a little bit more focus on the political aims that we're trying to achieve rather than uh, that huge and unrealistic chart. And it's interesting because, you know, obviously we've had a lot of ministerial changes, so there's sort of conversations on the corridors of the House of Commons of how can you make a difference. And I was talking to a colleague the other day and said, how are you enjoying it and are you making a difference? And he sort of wobbled a bit and said, well, very little scope for making a difference in my level of ministerial role, but I have to manage with what I'm hoping to manage well and focus on one thing. And I thought, you know, one thing compared with the long list, I won't name the department or the minister will be identifiable, uh, it, it demonstrates, I think, the challenge of how of this initiative-itis. And we as politicians have to take some responsibility for that. Very often, I do, for, dare I say, I don't want to admit that sometimes the chair of the Public Accounts Committee feels sorry for permanent secretaries, but sometimes you have a permanent secretary in front of you and they are having to defend a policy that came because, and one example was a, a minister arrived in post, made a press, sent out a press release naming a policy, um, and then the departments had to all backfill the policy announcement. And that's, we all know, every Prime Minister I've worked under of Labour and Conservative, they suddenly make an announcement one day, or the worst thing is in their early PMQs, when they uh, answer a question, make a commitment, and the whole system has to go into overdrive to deliver on that commitment. And I think one of the things we've got to be a bit better at, and we've got to encourage the civil service to do and support them to do, is talk truth to power and say, this won't work at that pace because, or there's a better way of doing this, rather than running around and trying to find a way of delivering our political priorities. That's not because, of course, political priorities are absolutely central. That's the benchmark of our democracy. We elect a government, they have to do things. But sometimes those initiatives can actually dilute the core political message that a government uh, comes in uh, to deliver uh, because of the, the desire to be seen to be active. I remember when I was a Home Office Minister, which is now ooh, a decade ago uh, that I started doing that, 
Um, there was always a feeling that if you're not making an announcement, there'll be somebody out to attack you, especially in the Home Office, uh, you know, where the longevity of Labour Home Secretaries was not, uh, a, not a good record. Uh, and there was always this fear that, that something would come and hit you from behind, so you had to keep announcing uh, new things. And I think that is something that we as politicians need to learn to make life easier for this diminishing uh, civil service. But the managerial continuity is a really big uh, concern for us uh, just uh, uh, yesterday, we published a report um, about the emergency services network. This is to replace the system where our emergency services can communicate with each other. In that case, the senior responsible owner had been there from the very beginning, and we were quite staggered as a committee because uh, we couldn't remember the last time that had happened. Whereas uh, yesterday, we were talking to HMRC about just, well, we were talking about a number of things, but the concentric contract. So this is a contract where HMRC... Uh, contracted out uh, pursuit of fraud and error uh, in tax credits you've you'll have read the headlines there's been a lot of uh, a lot of reports on it and we were we were looking at the investigation the national audit office had done there had been three responsible owners for a two year contract you know this is not a good way of running a business it means that the buck doesn't stop with anyone that no one has an interest and i think we've got to look at and this is where uh, the work that bernard jenkins committee is doing is also particularly important look at what incentives there are for the civil service in sticking to with a project i remember when i was a minister so it's a long time now and things we hope will have changed but it doesn't seem to change much and i said to someone that's fantastic that's the second project you delivered ahead of time and under budget you know what's the next one he said oh no i have to move now or my career will be over you know i have to move to a different completely different role and he was going on to something completely different when clearly he had good project management skills so the skills of the civil service i think are, are really key um and I mean, the, also the thinning out of the civil service means we're losing senior people. And John Thompson from HMRC acknowledged this yesterday, that with the, the, the change in HMRC estate, so 170 offices coming down to 13 major hubs and a few satellites, that they're going to be losing staff. If you're working in Red Ruth and you're a specialist in something, I don't know if there are specialists in anything in Red Ruth, but you know, for example, that your nearest office would be Bristol. So there'll be a lot of staff losing their their uh, their jobs. Around 10,000, around 5,000 uh, will be leaving, uh, and that means that there will there'll be a lot of institutional memory loss. And he acknowledged there's going, there's no way easily, and he's looking at this. So it'll be interesting for the institute maybe to talk to him. How does he capture? that long-term institutional memory and how do they make sure that that's valued uh, in the organisation. Um, the major projects is a, is a huge area of interest for us on the Public Accounts Committee. Um, of course, we've now got the Infrastructure Projects Authority. We're a bit nervous that you've got two different, slightly different aims in one organisation. We, we were a great fan of the MPA when it was set up, Major Projects Authority. Um, but the skills in procurement uh, that that they underline are, are really uh, essential and one of the good initiatives that has taken place in recent years is that senior civil servants so one below uh, director general generally go go off to side business school where they learn about project management and they come back uh, better equipped and something Richard Bacon who uh, is the deputy chair of, of the committee and I uh, are very keen to promote is that all we think all politicians I say this to colleagues in the room uh, Tom Brake I see here others you know we ought to go and learn this because you never know which MP is going to become the minister and if we don't understand ourselves about what the challenges are in a major project then the danger is we ask civil servants to do something in short time because our priorities are often you know this well if we're lucky if you're lucky as a civil servant it's the five years of a parliamentary term but often we have you know pacey demands we're demanding of the civil service we need to understand how we need to line our policy ducks up in order in order for the civil service to be able to deliver and that's so even more important with a reduced uh, civil service I'm interested that you touch on morale, uh, as you do, because one of the concerns I had, and I, f I flagged this up in my annual report, is the concerns about how easy it is, or in, well, rel relative in different departments, how easy it is to talk truth to power. How easy is it for a civil servant to call out uh, a minister or even a senior colleague and say this isn't going to work. And I, you know, some of the things I've highlighted there, things around the NHS budget. You know, we have an emperor's new clothes situation too often, where the desire is to please. And one of those worst things is when number ten, as I say, whichever number ten, I'm not talking necessarily about the, the current incumbent, announces an initiative, and no one will say, look, Prime Minister, we can do this, but we can do it a different way. Or Prime Minister, this isn't really going to work. And it's a real fear that your career is not going to advance if you actually question. Uh, the civil service. One thing you don't mention, but we're very keen on, is devolution. And I think that, that this is an area that we all need to be thinking about more. I don't think the public really quite understand yet that they're going to be voting for mayors uh, in uh, May. Uh, it's for some areas, it's a written, you know, 
even politicians there are not really sure uh, that they're that they're getting the message through. It's clearly, in some some areas like Manchester, you know, you're going to have high-profile candidates, Birmingham or West Midlands. But the impact on Whitehall is something we're looking at. We ask permanent secretaries, "What's happening to your headcount when you're devolving?" And they all, they go, oh, well, they, they're a bit puzzled by that. We think that headcount should be going down if powers are being devolved to local areas. Um, otherwise, where's the dividend? And it was interesting to see that John Rowles from NHS England has gone to work in Manchester. Now, will there be an exodus of civil servants? And actually, if you think about it, you're working in the glue that is Whitehall. And I mean, we love, we love government, but Whitehall has its moments, I'm sure. If, but you could be on the ground delivering, as John Rowles will hopefully be doing in Manchester, Greater Manchester. That's quite an exciting enticement, I think, for, for a lot of people. So I think we need to be watching that, um, and, and perhaps we can do some joint work on that. Um, and the transparency and the relationship between government is really key. It is going to be very complicated as money goes down. How do we follow the tax pound from Parliament? And how does a citizen locally understand how the tax pound is being spent there? And I think that's a real, uh, a real issue. So in the transparency, uh, relation, single departmental plans should <coughs> have some of that in their purview, but we know they're inadequate at the moment. It's quite a long way down, but if we don't no, with a, when it comes to it, if, uh, say, Greater Manchester says we don't actually have enough money for health, will the Chancellor just turn around and say, well, we gave you uh, the, what you're supposed to have, you have to manage within that? Or who's going to be the arbiter between whether the, the funding that's been devolved is, in fact, the correct amount? And the National Audit Office, obviously, <coughs> is looking at the national level, but there isn't, uh, with the loss of the Audit Commission, the same level of detail locally. And the idea that you're going to have a lot of mini public accounts committees as resourced as well resourced as we are is, I think, you know, a pipe dream. But there is no proper structure yet in place for local accountability. And when we, we raised things like, well, with particularly the DfE, we raise this often about schools, and we get the answer back. So, all right, parents will keep an eye on what's going on in schools. Well, let's be honest. I don't know how many people in the room here are parents of school-aged children right now, but. Most of us, selfishly, are interested in our child in their class on that day. We're probably not all looking at whether the school overall is performing, how it's spending its money. And, you know, schools are a bad example. If you go and do a mystery shop on any website, whether it's an academy, a free school, or a maintained school, try finding the governing body minutes or decisions about the budget or anything like that. It's, if, even if you were a parent that was interested, it's quite hard to find that. And I think it's, a, it's not good enough for governments just to say, it's over to other people. They need to make sure that they, the data is clear and is there. And we were heartened when Jonathan Slater came in front of us uh, earlier this week that he did talk about some of the information being readily available on gov.uk. It's early days, but you know, we hopefully that, will, that presages a, a change. And if you look at um, the devolution, just with sort of state local enterprise partnerships, the money that's being given to the growth deals, that's two billion already allocated, but that's projected to rise to 12 billion pounds. So this is, you know, we're talking significant amounts of money. And the LEPs, we just, when we were looking at this uh, recently, have very poor uh, accountability uh, set up. So they weren't publishing information about staff salaries. They didn't have declarations of interest from a lot of the people involved. And this is taxpayers' money. And if you're spending taxpayers' money, our view is you should be held to account for it. And so I think there's a, a real concern that if we don't get this right at the early stage with devolution, we'll actually undermine public confidence uh, in the system. The Brexit uh, element of your part, I think, well, it's going to be work for us all uh, for a long time to come. But you rightly highlight the issues around DEFRA. We've had uh, a long-standing interest, and Richard Bacon uh, has been a champion for us on the work of the Rural Payments Agency, which has been a kind of fiasco. Uh, is now assures us it will all be fine by next year, just as we're on the way out of the EU. So the Rural Payments Agency manages the common agricultural payment system uh, here in the UK. It has around 20 staff. The equivalent in Germany has around 200 to do the job. And then we've got Brexit coming up. And when they were in front of us recently, we asked Defra, what are you doing about Brexit? We were told there were a lot of conversations going on in the department. Didn't really give us much reassurance. But I'm heartened that you think it's going maybe a bit better than we got the impression. And when we asked the head of the Royal Payments Agency if he was advising ministers about what could be in place post-Brexit, uh, uh, he felt it wasn't his place to do that. And yet this is the man who's run it all the way through the problems and hopefully moving on to some uh, better times ahead. So we're quite concerned that, to, that the amount of work that DEFRA's got to do uh, is, uh, is not... It, well, they don't have the resources to deliver on it. Um, HMRC, on the other hand, John Thompson comes up with his list of six or, uh, key areas that he needs to focus on. Very alert 
to what the challenges are uh, in his department. Not that they're necessarily all resolved yet, and I think he would acknowledge that uh, too. And then the Home Office, of course, cut by nearly a fifth. Um, and the, as you rightly highlight, the immigration challenges. And no decision yet on EU nationals in the UK. And the, one of my concerns about that, as well as my own constituency concerns, is that the practical challenges of delivering uh, a system of registration for people already even in the UK, just, just let alone anything else, is enormous. And I was responsible for some of this in the Home Office, and no, what, it doesn't take very much to t t tip over the machine, uh, 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 our, immig our immigration machine, and, make, you know, and slow down the process. And this could be really quite catastrophic. And frankly, if, if I was in government, I'd be worrying about it, because the, the bad press from getting this wrong uh, and delaying people who've been living here for 20 years or whatever, getting their residency, uh, could be uh, quite catastrophic. I was also quite, um, uh, well, uh, uh, horrified, really, about the FOI, because I actually was the FOI minister at the Home Office. So I don't know what my record was like, but I'm pretty, I pretty much let everything go out, because I didn't see any reason, except for the, the normal legal constraints on security and so on, not to be out there. And sometimes I was quite impressed when a good journalist got a good story uh, and I was you know, glad that they'd winkled out some waste in spending in the Home Office. Um, but I don't think we should be frightened. If we're hiding things, then people will ask why. Also, just it fuels conspiracy, but it means the way we act is different. And I think if we know uh, as politicians and civil servants that what we do is out there and will be out there, then we should be quite um, happy about that. So in summary, I think you know the transparency issue is absolutely key. I don't think it's really embedded through the system. It's always a higher priority, but that is vital. And thank goodness for freedom of information, because at least that puts some of that on the statutory footing. Um, and accountability um, is going to be uh, a growing concern, I think, uh, with devolution and with the, the challenges of Brexit, because there's going to be so many other priorities that, don't, that seem to be uh, you know, the, the sexy day-to-day -day stuff, if you like. And then the fitness for purpose, doing too much. I think this is a really interesting uh, discussion. And I don't think we can lay all of that at the door of the civil service. I think we as politicians do need to take some responsibility for the demands we're putting on. But you know, we also have to have a realistic understanding about what government can achieve, what it should be doing, and what the priorities are. And I think you know, Brexit is, of course, knocking everything rather sideways. Um, but I think that uh, that is an area we need to be looking more at on the committee as well. So thank you very much.